Well, good morning. My name's Josh. I'm one of the pastors here. It's great to see you again. Hopefully you had a, a wonderful, restful holiday season. Not only uh, spending time together with your family and your friends and exchanging gifts and eating too much food, but reflecting on Christ and His coming and, and why we can enjoy all of those things to the full, because they're not the end of our joy, but pivots and pointers to the deeper realities of happiness, which are found in in God. Uh, thank you for those of you who are joining us online, viewing uh, through our YouTube page. We miss you being here, and I know you miss being here, but uh, as sometimes happens, there are things that uh, draw us away, and it's great that, that you're able to, to join us from afar, uh, at least this week, but we hope to see you soon. Uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, again, online or in person, we would love to connect with you. The best way to do that, or the cleanest way to do that, is to uh, fill out one of those cards in front of you and drop it in the uh, black boxes on the side of the back wall there, and we'll follow up with you. Or even better, take it to the Connect desk in the lobby. We have some gifts for you, and we can answer any questions that you have, uh, as well as we have an app, Redemption Church West Virginia. Uh, if you go on there, there's a way to fill out a Connect card there as well. I'll follow up with you personally, just saying thank you, introduce myself, I'd love to hear your story, what's going on in your life, how we can uh, serve you in any next steps of connecting to, to Jesus, to this church, or uh, any appropriate ways to, to deeply connect you to, to other people. Psalm uh, 16, I'll use as our, our verse of call to worship this morning, verse 11, excuse me, verse is it verse, yeah, verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. It's a great verse I reflected on on New Year's Eve, actually, as I looked forward into the new year, that those are God's promises to me, to you, to all of us who name the name of Christ. God's path, God's presence, and God's pleasures. You know I'd say it that way as a preacher, all PPP uh, alliteration there. But all of those will be our gifts from God as His plan for us unfolds over the next 12 months. That uh, we don't know what they are, what His plans are, what His path is. Being people of faith, we know that whatever happens individually or for us as a church, that it will be a part of His plan. But also being biblical people and realists, we expect that there will be tests uh, or difficulties, we may call them, maybe even suffering. And at the beginning of the year, God doesn't tell us when they'll come or how they'll arrive or how long they'll stay or the degree to which we'll feel them. But whatever it is, again, we know that it's God's path, it says, of life, not death, leads to life for His people. That His presence will be with us all the way through it, and that ultimately we can have confidence that it will lead to pleasures forever. Go ahead and stand with me. We have uh, leading us this morning in the singing, uh, the incredibly gifted Maven Miller. Uh, and even more impressive than her, her skills and her talent is her, uh, her love for God, her love for people. I've had a front row seat on many occasions as she interacts uh, with those not only in our church but in our city. And she embodies what uh, the uh, 18th century American theologian Jonathan Edwards says that we're to be doing here as we gather on Sundays for public worship. He says, first, we need to lift up God as He really is so that He can be clearly seen. That's what we'll do in everything that we do this morning. But that's not sufficient. Second, that we then need to delight deeply in what we see. And so that's what we're going to get after in, in singing. So sing loud and passionately and 
delightful as we, we see God uh, as he is. Welcome to Redemption Church.
Isaiah 53, 4 through 6 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Shame. 
My name is Rory. I'm one of the pastors here, and we are going to transition now into our time of pastoral prayer, which for this morning's prayer will be uh, founded upon the words in this book right here. Some of you may be familiar with it, The Valley of Vision. Uh, the Valley of Vision, I would highly commend to you, if not this year, then every single year of your life and thereafter. The Valley of Vision is a collection of prayers uh, from the 16th through 18th century, so old dead guys that have written before us. And the reason that I'm doing this this morning is to model the reality that sometimes it's better to let the prayers of others inform your own prayers. It can be a good spiritual discipline. It can really humble you to say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to pray, but I know men who've come before me would know what to pray. And so this morning, I'm going to take two short prayers from the Valley of Vision, combining them into one for our sort of new year, as well as end of the previous year, blessing and prayer this morning. So would you bow your heads and join me in prayer? O oh, love beyond compare, you are good when you give, and you are good when you take away. You are good when the sun shines upon me, and you are good when the night gathers over me. You have loved me before the foundation of the world, and in love you redeemed my soul. You love me still, in spite of my hard heart, my ingratitude, and my distrust of you. Your goodness has been with me during another year, leading me through a twisting wilderness, leading me when I retreat and helping me to advance, leading me when I was beaten back and making sure that I go headway. Your goodness will be with me in the year ahead. And so I hoist up my sails, I draw up my anchor with you as the blessed captain and pilot of my future as of my past. I bless you that you have covered my eyes to the waters ahead. If you've appointed storms of tribulation, you'll be with me in them. If I have to pass through waves of persecution and temptation, I won't drown. If I die this year, then I will see your face all the sooner. If a painful end is to be my lot, grant me grace that my faith fail not. If I am to be cast out from the service I love, if I lose my job this year, I can make no complaint. Only glorify yourself in me, whether in comfort or calamity, as a chosen vessel met always for your use. Give me a grace that precedes follows, guides, sustains, sanctifies, and aids in every single hour of this year so that I may not for one moment be apart from you, O Lord. But instead, I may rely on your spirit to supply every thought, speak in every word, direct every step, prosper every work, build up every ounce of faith, and give me a desire to show forth your praise, to talk about your love, and to advance your kingdom. I launch my ship on the unknown waters of this year with you, O oh Father, as my harbor, with you, O oh Son, at my helm, and with you, O oh Spirit, filling my sails. Guide me to heaven with my belt fastened, my lamp burning, my ear open to your calls, my heart full of love, and my soul free. Give me your grace to sanctify me, your comforts to cheer me, your wisdom to teach me, your right hand to guide me, your counsel to instruct me, your law to judge me, and your presence to stabilize me. May your fear be my awe and your triumphs my joy. May it be so amongst us, your people, 
and all Redemption Church together said, Amen. That was a great prayer. That's, that's how you want to come up preaching, is, is having that prayed over you and for you, and, and it's a great prayer to get ready to listen. <clears throat> there is something both beautiful and substantial whenever that happens whenever deep things happen get together. They, the, the synergy of their union sort of causes us to pay attention, turn our head, lean in, and not just be attracted, but drawn into the depth, into the beauty, into the, to the substance. Uh, great music does that. I did something this past holiday season I've never done before and uh, didn't tell anybody I, I did it, uh, is on Sunday nights, a lot of times I'll, as a way to sort of decompress from the day, and I listen to sermons from usually old men of a different tradition than mine with pipe organs, and I listen to that music, and, and so I'm kind of of that bent, but I, I pulled up the... Sydney, Australia uh, Philharmonic Orchestra and watched their performance of Handel's Messiah. Never done that. Many of you have done that probably every year. And I I noticed that there was so much going on I couldn't keep up with. Great vocalists, but it wasn't about the vocalists. There was a whole choir behind them blending in their voices at the same time. There were melodies and counter melodies and there was uh, uh, instruments over here doing their thing and other instruments over here doing their thing. All of it blending together into this majestic anthemic. I had no idea what was happening, but I was moved to tears regularly. As the voices and the music came together to produce not only beauty, but depth and mystery. Some of you are like, I'm not watching Handel's Messiah by the Sydney Philharmonic Orchestra. Well, all right. Well, what about Levon Helm from the band? You ever watch The Last Waltz, the documentary? He is describing his music, and he says, well, a lot of the music that we play is... is you know, a blend of, of jazz and, and delta blues and country and western swing and a lot of that gospel music that we grew up listening to in the South. And Martin Scorsese says, well, what do you call it? Or that big Levon Helm grin, he goes, well, I guess we call it rock and roll. Uh, there's beauty and depth even in that blending melting pot of, of that kind of of music. That's one of the great things about our nation. All of these cultures absorbed and assimilated and melted together of different races and ethnicities and styles and dialects. I guess we'll call it America. Well, if that's true of of music, true of nations, It's certainly true of of God's book. God has told us in this thing we call the scriptures, the Bible, exactly who he is, exactly who we are, exactly what he's doing and why he's doing it. Not everything exhaustively, but the big things, the beautiful things, the substantial things, the depth. And better than Dostoevsky and Shakespeare as they have this grand meta narrative that they're able to weave together with multiple inner stories that project the major themes of the big story, God's is better than all of them put together. And he says that he's putting together a people of every nation, tongue, and tribe, of men and women of different wirings and personalities and styles and approaches to not 
only to glorify His name, but to be His people. And that we will be a beautiful people. That we will be a substantial people. And we'll be a deep people. And you can't miss it, how he's doing it in our day, as we've been studying that fifth book of the Bible, or the New Testament, called the book of Acts, which tells the story of the early Christians. What they did, how they did it. How this whole thing got started that we've been born into the first time, our birthday, but then our second time at our second birth when we've put our faith in Christ and we become a part of God's family, His church. And He tells us in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, this main message of how this will all play out. How this message of God and His Son Christ and the forgiveness of our sins and eternal life and our purpose in the world arrived to us. It started in Acts 1.8 when Jesus told His just a handful of followers, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And they do that. And that, that's the main melody of the book of Acts. That's the main song. That's the main message, the main theme. Uh, and we see in Acts chapter 1, verse 7, they start in Jerusalem. And people are witnessing and coming to Christ. In chapters 8 and 9, it gets into Judea and Samaria. And then in chapter 10, it begins to, to move out into the end of the earth. And that's a message that's still going on to this day. That when a person comes to God, they come to Him through His Son. They come to Him through His life, His death, and His resurrection. The perfect life that you must have to be in God's family, you can't perform. So Jesus, as your substitute, lives that for you. The punishment under the wrath of God that all sin deserves and must be paid for God's justice to be satisfied, and, and you've contributed to, Jesus pays for on the cross as your substitute. And then by raising him from the dead, God says, I accept his life and his death on your behalf. Eternal life with me is now yours. And you receive it freely through faith. You, you, you can't... Read Acts and not get that that's the message, that that's the theme, that that's the point. Getting that message out to as many people as possible and doing that until Jesus returns. But don't think for a second that that's the only thing that's happening in Acts. There is a counter melody that not just this one great thing here in Acts, but there's another great thing called discipleship. And when two beautiful and substantial things get together, deep things happen. It's not sufficient for evangelism to take place as a church. That's essential. But that's just the beginning of a lifetime of transformation into the person of Jesus Christ that you too can not only receive Christ's positionally, but you can become like Him, practically. And that happens as Christians begin to blend their lives together, life on life, person on person, in ordinary ways, with the Scriptures and the Holy Spirit. Again, another powerful combo, working out this beauty and depth and substance in your life. So it's no surprise when we get to the end of Acts chapter 18 that Luke, the author of Acts, is putting before us that combo of evangelism and discipleship in such a way as to say, I don't want you to miss it. Don't lose sight of the discipleship that is happening. Now before we get there, I want to stop off in two places. I want to turn first to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Because when we read the book of Acts, remember we've talked about this, this is descriptive passages, not prescriptive. 
Meaning it's a book describing things that happen. And there's theology and truth to be learned there, but the verses aren't prescriptive to all Christians everywhere saying, do this, believe this, feel this, think this. The epistles do that. Those are prescriptive passages, meaning the epistles are the letters of the, Old, of the New Testament. That's not the apostles' wives. Those are the letters of the New Testament. And so in 2 Timothy 2, that's a prescriptive passage that is going to give us a foundation for what we see described in Acts 18. Chapter 2, verse 1 is where I'll be. And before I do, I want to read, or, yeah, read a definition of what I'm talking about when I, I say discipleship. Because it's a church word that's thrown around a lot, but we don't always know exactly what we're talking about. Discipleship is an informal, behind-the-scenes, character-training experience where one person works with one or a few in the living out of the Christian life and ministry. An informal, behind-the-scenes, character training experience where one person works with one or a few in the living out of the Christian life and ministry. See how the Apostle Paul says it to Timothy in chapter 2, verse 1 of 2 Timothy. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Here it is. What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So did you see the layers? Jesus taught Paul. Paul passes it on to Timothy. Timothy entrusts that to faithful men who will then teach others. And that's been happening for 2,000 years. The reason we have a Bible, the reason there's a church, the reason you're a Christian is because they obeyed that. And they've kept obeying that. And now the baton is in our hands. And it's our turn to pass that on to, to yet others. And if I could keep the race metaphor going, where is the breakdown typically taking place in a relay race? The handoff. The fumbling of the baton. Paul's saying, make sure that as fast as we run, and as talented as we are, that we don't fail to pass the baton to the next group. Uh, Paul's not alone. Go to Mark chapter 3. Again, this is a descriptive passage as well, telling of the life of Christ as a servant, particularly in Mark's gospel. <clears throat> but I do want to show that, that Jesus as well modeled this. It's amazing that in Jesus' three-year public ministry of a brief 33-year life or so, that he chose to really invest all of, most all of his time and energy in just a handful of people. That's how important he believed in discipleship. In verse 13, he went up on the mountain, Mark 3, and called to him those whom he desired... And they came to him, and he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Did you catch the order? He selectively chooses who will be his disciples. He first just calls them to be with him. And then he equips them to go out and do what he's, he's doing and what he does. And within that authority is included the command to continue that multiplication out when he leaves and the church continues. I mean, isn't that what Matthew 28, his final words to his disciples was before he ascended to be with the Father? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And now he gives it to us to go and tell people about Jesus. No. I now want you to go and have church services. No. Go have prayer meetings. 
Go take care of the poor. No. All those are biblical. All those are essential parts of the mission of the church. But all of those are feeders and means or practical outworkings of the command of Matthew 28, which is go make disciples, Christ-like followers, who will observe and continue on all that I've taught. So that's what we're talking about when we get to Acts 18. Now go there. I'll do this quick. I'm going to teach Acts 18 twice. The last part. I'm going to teach it this week and I'm going to teach it next week. And then in between we're having a membership meeting this Thursday, January 12th. Even though it's a members meeting, I want to invite all of you to come. I'm not going to have any in-house stuff there necessarily. It's going to be a vision casting of re-engagement, involvement, and discipleship, and evangelism as a church to really make a difference for God. And it's all going to sort of tie together over those three times together. So I can go quicker. But I'll probably still use all my time. But in Acts chapter 18, verse 1, we, we see this modeled for us. It starts with Paul. After this meaning preaching in Athens, he left Athens and went to Corinth all by himself. That's a major figure, major plot line, the life of the Apostle Paul in Acts. Spotlight is on him regularly. He's a big deal. Um, but just because he's that way he, and he's doing big things doesn't mean that he loses sight of one-on-one, or one with a few for the purpose of character training in the life of the Christian life, in ministry, in in the Christian life and ministry. He found a Jew named Aquila and a a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, sometimes in the New Testament called Prisca, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to, to leave Rome, and he went to see them. It says he found And he went to see them. That's the first thing I notice about his discipleship is he takes initiative. He doesn't wait for it to come to him. He doesn't wait for it to be legislated. He doesn't wait for it to be assigned by some other person. He he says, that's the task. I'm always looking. Who will I find? Who will I go to? To, verse 3, bring into my life. So there's personal involvement as well. And because he was of the same trade, same job, he stayed with them. I take it to mean that they even lived together and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. So so they were working and living alongside one another. There was up close. It wasn't just sit there, disciples, and let me lecture to you. Although I'm sure there was some formal teaching times. They were going around living life together. That's how disciples are made. That's how impact happens. One of my professors, Howard Hendricks, once once told me, Josh, you can impress people from a distance, but if you want to impact them, you've got to let them close. It's risky. It's vulnerable. That's messy. From a human perspective, it's inefficient. It takes time. Requires us to, to slow down. But you know what it does? It allows that proximity to elevate authenticity. It lets people in. And he teaches them, verse 3. Or excuse me, verse 4. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. Verse 11. I read that he, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So there's formal, there's informal, there's, there's theological depth, there's practical application. There's him listening to them as much as he's talking to his, to his disciples. And through that ongoing, regular, consistent, frequent, lengthy, in this case, involvement, life change happens. Might not always be impressive, but it'll be impacting. The people who I know the best and who know me the best are the same ones 
that are the least impressed with the stuff I do up here that you may be impressed with on Sunday. And they're also the people that are impacting me the most, and I'm impacting the most. It's supposed to be that way. That's, that's the plan. That's how it, it works. Now, the third thing I notice is not only is there initiative and is there involvement, but there's multiplication of his ministry to the next generation or the next level or the next iteration of what he's taught, even when he's nowhere around. That's where we pick it up in verse 18. After this, Paul stayed many days longer, and then he took leave of the brothers, that's the church there in Corinth that was started through Priscilla and, and uh, Aquila and Paul, and he set sail for Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila. I'll skip the last part of 18. I know that's an intriguing little sentence there. We'll get that next week. <clears throat> and they came to Ephesus in Asia. He'd been wanting to go there and wasn't allowed the first trip. Now he's there. And he left them, meaning Priscilla and Aquila there. But he himself, before I guess his boat sails out, went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I'll return to them if God wills. And he set sail from Ephesus. And again, next week, we'll see that he goes down to the church in Jerusalem for a little bit. He goes to Antioch for a little bit. And then he starts to go back to some of the churches he planted and makes his way back to, to Ephesus. But, but what I don't want us to miss is the discipleship fruit from Paul's life that takes place when he's over 1,500 miles away. Doesn't know the people involved beyond just Priscilla and Aquila. Doesn't know what's happening. But the gospel is advancing. Discipleship is happening because of his small investment in that couple for a year and a half, two years. Before I get into some of that depth, I, I'm really intrigued, particularly as a, a leader who, who wants to disciple a lot of people and is asked to disciple a number of times. I love the little comment in verse 20. He declined. That's empowering. He said no. Jesus had to say no. He didn't disciple everybody. Uh, Paul selected that couple in Corinth, and there were others he didn't select. And in Ephesus, even though there were many who wanted him to be there, he said, he said no. I want that to empower you. I, I, I'm unapologetic to say that, that it is God's will for you, it is biblical for you to be involved in your local church, life on life, with groups, serving, discipling, participating, giving, all of the, the stuff that's a part of the Christian life. But we have more going on at this church than you should be involved in. While we present a number of on-ramps ramps into discipleship and into the community and uh, of this Christian life we're living together, things like small groups and Bible studies and retreats and mission trips and service opportunities and discipleship groups of three and triads, all great things. You don't need to be doing all of them all the time. You need to realize where you are in this season of life where you can best make an impact on those you're discipling and where you need to grow and be discipled. And as church leaders, we want to help to connect you into that. But at the same time, it's going to basically come down to you deciding what you say yes to and what you say no to. And while involvement and participation is essential, many of the ways in which you get that is optional. I, I see, it's a preacher for you, I see all of that in he declined. I've had to learn that when we started this church from nothing or next to nothing. I was kind of like a door-to-door -door salesman. 
I'm getting in as many living rooms and as many coffee shops and as many college campus things and, and many things, as many things going on in the city as I can to sort of spiritually get my foot in the door to tell people about Jesus. And some people heard about Jesus for the first time and came to Christ. And I said, great news, you're a part of the church, I'm a pastor. Other people were Christians at some point in the, previously, and they, but they weren't involved in the church. And so I cast the vision of what we were about and why and, and called them to join that team. Some were already involved in church, and with the blessing of their, their leaders, they were released to come help us start this, this new work. But it was door to door. I mean, I'm a lot. I don't say no to anything. A yes, in any, way, in any way, is a way for me to get in this opportunity. But as the church grew, that became less realistic and scalable. And so I had to release what one pastor's called the Chick-fil-A mentality. How may I serve you today? As the pastor who goes to every birthday party and every small group and disciples every person and is at every event. And I had to distance myself from some things. And that's a transition. It was hard for me and sort of ministry idolatry and pride even to do that. And then on top of that, you're part of an Acts 29 network that wants you to speak at a number of things or to take on leadership within the network. And I say no almost to all of that. I worked on staff with a guy for a number of years. I was shocked that I would pass up some of those opportunities. I said, it means I've got to be away on Sunday from this church. It means I can't pastor these people. That's my calling. Not everybody's. But I get to decline. My wife's a master at this at clearing the calendar, at saying no. And she's discipled me in realizing that my most important disciples are in my house. They need my presence. They need my time. And they beat you when it comes to discipleship. But he declined, and, and Paul can say no with confidence and rest because you know what? He knows discipleship works. That it's not about any one person, it's about the Spirit of God, and it's His mission and His plan, and He will not fail. And he trusts that those two years with Priscilla and Aquila, they can, they can get the job done. And if you're not convinced of the genius of multiplication, look at verse 24. This is in Ephesus. Paul's nowhere around. A Jew named Apollos, look at what we're, we're told about him. He's a native of Alexandria. He came to Ephesus. Alexandria is the capital of Egypt, and in that day, in many years, it was the center of the intellectual world. It was a who's who's place to, to develop the mind. Remember in the day with no printing press, you have books everywhere. Alexandria had the largest library in the world. You wanted to read books, you went to Alexandria. That's where they were. You know what the second biggest university or library was? Where it was? Tarsus. That's where Paul's from. Christianity is a, is a faith of reading. It's a faith of study. It's a faith of learning. Not just intellectual development, but heart development. Life development. We're a people of a book. And not just this book, but the book of, books of Christian history. We study and we learn and we grow. Everywhere Christians go, where do they bring? What do they bring? Literacy. They teach people to read. Because it's essential to the faith. This guy could read, and he could learn. He was eloquent as well. He's a great speaker, knew his Bible. He was competent in the Scriptures. So he's a, a gifted, gifted man. Everything you'd want in a communicator and a teacher and a leader in the, in the church. But look at what else. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he was fervent in spirit. So he's passionate. He's Bold, he spoke, and he taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. Verse 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Look at that gift mix. But look who else is in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila, who had been discipled by Paul, heard him, they took him and explained to him the way of God more accurately. That's a nice way of saying Get some coffee. Your sermon was a little off. Well, what was he off on? Well, back in verse 25, I skipped that on purpose. He knew only of the baptism of John. 
In the Gospels, John the Baptist was baptizing people for repentance and faith of the kingdom that would be personified and come in Christ. And John said, I baptize with water, but there's one who's coming who will baptize in the Spirit. And Jesus was that one. And in Acts 2, the Spirit fell on all who believed. And so there's this transitionary period between John and, and Jesus, and we're going to see here in a couple weeks, even after the church, in which the Spirit had not fallen on all true believers, including people like Apollos, potentially, certainly the people that Apollos was teaching. He didn't know that the Holy Spirit had come yet. Nobody taught him. So he's a believer. He trusted Christ, subjective, but I'm convinced he writes Hebrews. So he's, he knows his stuff. But, but he didn't know about the Spirit. Priscilla Aquila did. So they took him, took him aside, which, which tells me that, that that's a part of the discipleship. That there's tact, there's gentleness, but there's correction. There's exhortation. There can even be hard things said. But it's done in love and kindness. That whole sharp, iron sharpening iron in the book of Proverbs that the book of Proverbs discusses. Uh, and I take it from Apollos. He was teachable. He was humble. I mean, he's the smartest guy in the room. What are you going to tell me? I know more. You've been to Alexandria? You can't even read. Look at this. Oh, they take him aside. He's, he's willing to learn. He's willing to, to grow. They do it privately, I would, I would take it, so there's no, there's no embarrassment. What are they doing? Discipleship is an informal, behind-the-scenes, character-training experience where one person works with another or a few in the living out of the Christian life. It's beautiful. But what happens next? More discipleship. Verse 27. He wished to cross to Achaia. That's just another word for Corinth, another way to say Corinth. That's southern Greece. And the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. Isn't that great? That when the, the vision of God in Apollos' life was fresh, that I've, I've done some good work here, I've grown through your ministry, Priscilla and Aquila, I now want to go back to that church that you guys and Paul planted in Corinth and encourage them. And build them up. You guys left them. And I'm sure they're fine. But I, I'd love to go and, and build on what you, the foundation that you guys laid. And what did they do? Encouraged him. They released him. They supported him. They sent him out. They, they even write letters saying, man, take this guy in. He is gifted out the ears. If you liked Paul, man, are you going to love Apollos? He can teach it. Meaning not just is he theologically correct, I bet he was fun to listen to. It's great to, to learn from. Do that with your disciples. Release them when it's time for them to go. They're not always your disciples. They get to go do other things, new things, perhaps bigger and better things than you do. That's great. They sh that's what you want as a disciple, for them to outpace you. Just like you want as a father, you want your kids to do better than you did. I've discipled a number of people through the years, and I constantly am telling them, them that. When I start listening, they, they're using my vocabulary words. They say the way I say it. They don't mimic me. Don't preach my style. Don't use my humor. I'm surprised I get away with it. You can't get away with it. Don't plant church the way I plant a church. You're, you do it better than I can. Don't, don't disciple the way I disciple. We've got me. We need you. Definitely don't cancel the way I cancel. You, you, you've got gifts and approach and a style. It's going to take all hands on deck to get the mission done. And, and that's why God makes us all... All different. It's beautiful. Look how effective it was. When Apos, uh, excuse me, Apollos, when he arrived, he greatly helped those through the grace he had, who through grace had believed, and he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ, the, that the Christ was was Jesus. I'm convinced he does it better than Paul. If you read First Corinthians, 
Paul is writing to this church after Apollos had been there and, and he's heard how they're doing and he discovers that Apollos has risen in the eyes of the church on par with Peter and Paul. And even an unhealthy favoritism has broken out in which some people, I like Peter better, I like Paul better, I like Apollos better, and how's this for pious? Some people are like, I'm a Jesus man myself. <laughs> and, and, and Paul doesn't care that people like other people's preaching more than him, but, but he's, I don't like the, the, the clickishness. So he says, what then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants, that's who. Through whom you believed as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the growth. So it's neither he who plants nor he who waters that is anything, but only God who gives the growth. See how it comes full circle? Chapter 18 starts with Paul by himself in Corinth. He finds a couple, disciples them. They get some other people together. Before you know it, they got a little church. They get that uh, uh, solid. They leave. They go to Ephesus. He says, you guys stay here. I've got some things to do. He goes off by himself. While he's gone, Priscilla and Aquila, the couple that he disciples in Corinth, grabs a couple of people. They build into them. Then they release Apollos, who goes back to the church they started and builds them up in even, into even greater heights than it was before. Apollos was able to do things they were never able to do, and they were able to do things Apollos wasn't able to do. And it all works together, what? Beautifully, substantially, so that what deep things happen. It's discipleship. It's discipleship. All right, two applications. Number one, the greatest impact of biblical truth happens in discipleship. That's a... Risky thing for a preacher to say, but I believe it. It's true. The greatest impact of biblical truth happens in discipleship, meaning the best context, the best medium through which what you are learning from the Bible, how you are applying it to your life in personal, practical ways so that you are being transformed in the image of Christ happens best in those personal relationships where people know you deeply, you know them deeply, and you're working it out. That doesn't, the best way to get truth into your life is not from me, from this pulpit. It's not the best way. Nobody believes in preaching more than me. Nobody loves it more than me. It's biblical. It's essential. It should have primacy of place in our corporate worship gatherings, preaching where we hear from God. But it's not the best way to get the truth applied to your life. That's discipleship. You need a person, not a voice. I was thinking through this this past week, and a couple of months ago, a couple came to our church for the first time. I introduced myself, got to know them. I said, how'd you end up here? This morning, they said, well, we've been listening to the podcast a number of uh, months, and we thought, we'll put a face to, to the voice. And I said, well, I'm sorry. I've got a face for radio, I'm afraid. And the wife said, well, I've actually watched online. I knew what you looked like. And I said, well, look, i got legs, too. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, this, that's a perfect illustration. You don't need a half a person and a voice just saying things. You don't know me. It's, it's good that my feet don't show because they're full of clay. They stink. They stumble. You need a person, a whole one, who you know and, and knows you. In discipleship, we, we get that. Second, the best time to start is now. Now, that's the great thing about discipleship. There's no right way. I've done a thousand things in, in discipling people. It's got to be biblical content, but other than that, sometimes I use books. Sometimes we don't use any books. Sometimes we just read through the Bible. Sometimes we get together and pray. Sometimes it can be Tuesday, 6.30 to 7.30 in the morning. Sometimes it can just be, go. hey, I'm running errands. Come with me. I'm going to the ball game. You want to come with me? I'm watching the ball game. You want to come over? Let's go to a concert. 
Let's get meals together. Let's go running. Let's crossfit. Whatever. You into essential oils? Let's do it. <laughs> you know, the oil is like the Holy Spirit. It falls upon us. And <laughs> you can do whatever you want. A million ways. But start now. If you do want some practicalities, I, I did like a 10-week sermon series on discipleship that was based on uh, Robert Coleman's The Master Plan of Evangelism. We have the book, I think, still out at the lobby as well. That book's great, fantastic, on discipleship, practicality, how to do it. Uh, we've got triads that are set up. One of our members, Cindy Bagley, put together. It is just out of this world, great content. The ladies work through. You know what? Guys can do that too. Uh, we, we can help you get involved, but, but you don't have to wait on us. Just informally think, who's a little bit ahead of me that I could learn how to be a better Christian from? I want to get some time with them. Who's a little bit behind me that I want to serve in this way? I'm going to initiate. Don't wait for some hot shot to come and say, hey, I want you to be my disciple. Or don't wait for some young Christian to come up and say, you're a great man, a woman of faith. Will you disciple me? Take the initiative and get involved. I guess if I were going to boil it down, I would say this way. If you're not involved in, in some capacity in that way, does it bother you? I want it to bother me. A sort of a godly discontent. I'm not being discipled and I'm not discipling. And again, I'm not giving you something more to do. Just bring somebody along with you while you do what you're already doing. That's it. Because you know what? Something both beautiful and substantial happens when deep things get together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, it's a uh, sermon on discipleship, and, and that's what the text led to, and, and that's uh, what I, I felt you wanted me to preach on, but I, I can't allow a sermon to go by without calling people to faith. Discipleship starts by coming to Christ, not another Christian. As great as it is to have Christians in our life and as essential as it is as a part of your plan for growth, they're sinners and they can't live the perfect life in my place or die on the cross for my sins. Jesus alone has done that. So right now, under the sound of my voice, if there is any who cannot remember a time in which they said in faith in their heart... To you, I'm a sinner. I need your perfection and your forgiveness and your eternal life. And all of that has been provided for me in Christ Jesus. And I take him now. I want to be in your family. Father, we need a, a special help to do that as well. Meaning, be in the family. We uh, are constantly failing. We are constantly being drawn away to lesser loves. And when it comes to discipleship, uh, it can even become a, an idol itself. We can begin to find our identity and our happiness and our capacity to disciple. So uh, give us your spirit to, to make us like Christ to think clearly with insight about what we're becoming and how we're getting there and to give us the courage to obey what we're learning. And most of all, we want Jesus Christ exalted in our life. And it's in his name we pray. As we transition now into our time of communion, I uh, want to bring up a passage that Pastor Josh brought up in our last uh, Sunday morning gathering, which is from John 6. Uh, if you're familiar with John 6, you know it begins, um, or well, goes into the story of when Jesus fed 5,000 people. Fed them all to the point of they had leftovers. 
And after he feeds them, he tells them um, of a greater miracle, which is that unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. You're not my disciple. And the 5,000 hear that, and, and they say, we don't get it. We're out. We're done. But the 12 stay by. And in verse 66 of John chapter 6, it says, After this, many of his disciples turned back, and they no longer walked with him. So Jesus said to the twelve, You want to go away as well? You want to join them? And then Peter gives to me, I think, the greatest hallmark of any disciple of Jesus Christ, which is this. He says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. If that is you this morning, then this meal is for you. If you can say in the heart of your heart, in the deepest trenches of your soul, who else can I go to? For he has the words of eternal life. Then this meal is for you. As we pass the plates in and amongst ourselves, we will say to each other, this is Christ's body broken for you. For he is the bread of life and gives nourishment to your soul. And then we'll pass the, the cup and we'll say, this is Christ's blood shed for you. For he is your nourishment and the satisfier of your hearts. So take and eat. This is Christ's body for you. And take and drink. This is Christ's blood for you.
Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you are new, looking to connect in any way, there are connect cards in the seat backs in front of you. You can fill those out, put them in the give boxes on the opposite ends of the black wall back there. And you can also take them, if you're an extrovert, to the Connect desk where we have a little gift for you. And you can get signed up on our app, which is Redemption WV, on both of the Apple, Google, whatever those are nowadays. And uh, I want to make three quick announcements. Um, you heard Pastor Josh mention this Thursday, January 12th at 6 p.m., we have a members meeting to which all y'all are invited to. We're going to have dinner and child care provided. So please make an effort to come on out to that. Tonight, youth group is back on. I'm pumped and excited and ready to get not wild nor crazy. <laughs> but anyways, then on Saturday, uh, the 14th, we have our second Saturday men's breakfast. So if you're a man from whatever ages and whatever backgrounds, come on out and get some free food and uh, some good fellowship with one another. All right, let me send you out with this benediction. <clears throat> Now may the Lord make all of you, the people of Redemption Church, into a group of disciples passionate about making disciples who will then in turn make disciples. May each of you find someone who you will disciple into maturity, and may you be found by someone who will do the same for you, for one cannot be discipled alone. Go now from this place, make disciples, not of you, but of Jesus starting here, starting now. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all Redemption Church together said, Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.